When I first read the spec sheet of this camera, I thought this is a more modern version of the Canon 600D that many content creators used because the Canon 600D was by then sort of a workhorse. You could take pictures, but that was also pretty capable of doing decent videos. I thought this is a more modern camera that can do that. This is a 4K version of that because this camera has the fully articulated screen, 4K capability, clean HDMI out and the slow motion in full HD. So I thought it must be one of those budget workhorse and I was pretty disappointed and this video is gonna be about why. <laughs> So before to keep going in the video and start ranting about this camera, let me put a full disclaimer there. My focus is more about videos and you may argue that this is a hybrid and it's more focused on pictures. But my argument with that would be that this camera has got the microphone port, the flippy screen to just record yourself, 4K capabilities, slow motion features that were pretty much advertised and selling points of this camera. So before you start commenting, hey, this is a hybrid camera, just get the camcorder if you want that. Um, no, disclaimer over, let's keep going with the rant. First off, there is no eternal picture profile. I was aware of that and I was cool with that. But what I did not like is that you cannot tweak the contrast, saturation and colors of the camera. It is pretty much select a picture profile and shoot your video. And I hated that, especially because this camera is pretty over sharp, at least to my taste, you know, it's a bit too sharp and you can't do much about it. And in post-production, these things are kind of tricky to fix. That was number one problem with it. No Instagram. No focus peaking while you're recording. The mic preamp isn't that great. The tripod mount is placed in a way that will not allow you to open the lid to just remove the SD card and the battery. This is really annoying for me. I was aware of that when I bought it, but still, it's a pain nonetheless. Oh, but there is a fix for that. You can get a camera grip, which is fantastic. And after you place your grip, you will be able to free your battery. And I will link it down below. The battery life of the camera is not really amazing. And combined with the fact that you cannot charge the camera while powering on the camera, with the USB-C, it makes that's not a very pleasant experience. Although there is a dummy battery that you can buy that will just simply fix this. If you're interested in that, it's a great solution and I will link it down below. The autofocus is not amazing. It may lose you when you're moving forward or away from the lens. Although this may have to be because I'm using just the kit lens that it comes with it. And this lens is not particularly great for autofocus either. That thing initially had driven me insane. These dials that don't have anything written on it, so you don't know what are they assigned to, and they change according to the mode you are in. So if you are in picture mode, this dial will change the profile, and this dial will change the shutter speed, this dial will change the aperture. But if you are in video mode, this dial now is the shutter speed. This dial is still the aperture and this dial changes according to any buttons that you press. I'm not even sure if that is right or not because it's still confusing. There is no way to set this dial so that this is always shutter speed or this is always picture profile. After a while you get used to it, but I would have preferred if I didn't have to get used to this at all. If you want to do something pretty straightforward, like changing the ISO, it is really madness. In picture mode is fine, but in video you need to tap on the display, then go into the quick menu and then ISO and then remember which of the dials will change it. Another very annoying thing is that I set one of these two assignable function buttons to modify the ISO. It couldn't be just the ISO, it was just a video ISO. So simply changing something like ISO should be a glance, but it's not. The smartphone application isn't fantastic. It required me to have the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, 
and the GPS all activated in order to use the camera and I couldn't even turn them off after the two appeared. I hate this. I hate when manufacturers are doing this. Get back to just use the Wi-Fi. I really don't know why you need all the sensors activated on your phone. It's draining the battery of the camera, it's draining the battery of the phone. There is simply no reason why you would want the GPS to be activated in order to control my camera remotely. The camera splits the videos every four gigabytes, which is kind of more difficult to edit. I could have lived with all of that if it wasn't for the major downfall of this camera, which is the overheating issue. This camera was a pain for me just to do some studio work. As a primary camera, it wouldn't work, not even as a secondary camera, because simply the camera would just overheat all over again. If you're interested in a more detailed video about the overheating, that's the video I'm referring to. It's a very dedicated overheating test that I run. I've done it with battery, over HDMI, recording internally, externally, using dummy battery, everything you can think of. I could live with the limitations of 15 minutes in 4K. If it wasn't that, the camera has been very crippled even when it comes to recording over HDMI. When you have HDMI out, the camera is in standby but it's streaming a weird frame rate so you cannot actually use the footage that's coming out of the HDMI when it's in standby. You're forced to hit record button and have the camera set to record over HDMI only and even by doing so the camera just stops recording after 18 to 20 minutes because it overheats. To make things worse, the camera takes a very long time to cool down as well, so it's not like one of those cameras where it's overheating, then you wait five minutes and you're able to do your shot again. It takes a very long time to cool down. So with this aside, is there anything that I liked about the X-T200? Well, yeah, I love the display. I mean, this display is pretty much the best display you can get from a camera this small. It's pretty bright outside, you can see things very well. Also the camera has a pretty decent viewfinder, I love that too. This camera takes a pretty decent slow motion, you can do 120 frames per second in full HD. I was happy with this, I had a lot of fun and even just this feature may justify a purchase of the Fuji X-T200 because there is not many cameras that have interchangeable lenses that have a decent slow motion, have this price point. Even just for that, that could be a point to buy this camera. You have some limitations when it comes to autofocus, but if you get this camera and you get the zoom lens that Fuji has, I think it's 55 to, actually, let me go and get it. 50 to 230 millimeters. This is a very good slow motion box right there simply because you have a very good zoom range the stabilization is decent and you have pretty much all the features available and finally this camera takes amazing pictures if you're a person that takes primarily pictures and just a little bit of videos every now and again you will be just blown away by this camera the pictures are amazing it's a joy to just use it without needing to photoshop pictures too much actually you can get away without photoshopping your pictures at all if you need something that needs to go on social media or something like that so to conclude, even though the Fujifilm X-T200 has a relatively low price range, it kind of hooked me and forced me to buy an XS10 right away after I got the camera because I was like, whoa, this camera is amazing, it takes amazing pictures and the videos are actually showing off very decent image quality and nice videos but I couldn't tweak the contrast and the sharpness was so much and all of that so I was like I need a real thing. The way I see the Fuji X-T200 is this is a sample. It's a sample of what Fuji can do. Do you want the real thing? Get the X-S10 or get the X-E4 at least or obviously the X-T4. Uh, this is just not a camera that I would recommend for doing videos on regular basis. Even the XS10 is incredibly limited when it comes to overheating and you really need to know how to handle it, but still, you can do some content regularly, you can rely on it. With this, 
I'll say no. So it really depends what you need to do with it. This was my honest opinion. I just wanted to share it with you. If you shoot only full HD and you take pictures and you're okay with just picking up a picture profile and just having to tweak the exposure and live with that, there's a lot that can be done with this camera. If you found this content useful, please press the like button, press the subscribe button to just be updated about more. I will compare this camera with XS10 as well. So if you're interested in that kind of content, you know, this will pop up very soon on the channel too. I'm Aleloy. This is Ale Suggest, audio and video suggestions for the creative minds. And I will see you here very soon.